I want everyone to ask, get asked one question. The next time you open your wallet and you decide to spend money, ask yourself, am I spending money because I want to or because a marketer seduced me to? I want to tell you a secret. Marketers spend $500 billion a year globally. What does half a trillion dollars mean? It means that marketers will do whatever it takes to seduce you, the consumer, to open up your wallet and spend money. Take a global brand such as Nike. They make $24 billion a year. That's a lot of money. $2.4 billion of that they spend for marketing. That might sound great from a business perspective. However, if you think about it from a consumer perspective, for every $1 Nike spends, they're expecting you, the consumer, to spend 12. I helped build the first technology platform that monetized iPhone and Android applications. I worked with big brands and agencies. And after being in technology, I started realizing the gap between a marketer and a consumer has become way too large. There are too many people punching the monkey. And if you look at that, what does that mean? Everyone now carries around them a smartphone, whether it be Android, Windows Mobile, an iPhone, etc. And what you'll realize is over time, a marketer is starting creating audiences around you. What you see behind you is live data from one of the platforms I helped build. And it shows you anonymously how audiences are working. So in this example, you have an audience that are cumulative in hospitals. Automatically, we deduce that that person is in the hospital field or in the medicine, which is pharma. And to a marketer, a pharma is a huge opportunity in terms of spend. Now, on the other side, you have a business traveler. That means this person frequents the airport, and they always go back home. Again, all of this is anonymous. However, you don't have to actually be doing anything. Consumers are actually seducing themselves without realizing it. The moment you open your wallet and you're spending money, ask yourself, am I spending money because I want to? or someone else is seducing me. I've now seen it. And what happens over time is the variance now goes back to the principles of what our parents always taught us. Number one, our parents always told us not to talk to strangers. Why? Because when you talk to a stranger, you have no idea what their trust is going to be. Are they going to take you for a ride? Are they taking advantage of you? What is it going to be? But guess what? In the digital age that we live in today, we are talking to strangers all the time. Every time we search, every time we tweet, every time we like something on Facebook, every time we post something on Instagram, we are talking to strangers constantly. The level of trust that we have with our digital replica has become too lenient. What is the second thing our parents always taught us? Don't judge a book by its cover. Why? Because when you judge a book by its cover, you're not really open to their emotion, their character, what drives them, who they really are. But guess what? The marketer has been replicated by algorithms. So algorithms and logic are what drives decisions. So let me take a step back. So we are talking to strangers, and algorithms are judging you, the consumer. Let's take an example. Netflix. Netflix has 35 million consumers globally. And what do they do? They mine all that data. So every time you watch a video, every time you share a video, rate a video, like a video, when you watch it on your phone, you watch it on your PC or your Xbox, all that data is being cumulative. And what do they do? They now bubbled up that Kevin Spacey is a great actor. People like him. They then did that for producers and directors. They then found that the House of Cards is something that was actually very much watched in Britain. So then they designed their own movie, which they also called House of Cards, and they knew with a high degree of certainty that the movie would be a hit. And guess what? The consumers became the writers. Everyone in the audience who's watched something on Netflix, who's accessed Netflix, you have helped make this movie. Now you might think to yourself, that's great. We are now in the digital revolution. Movies are becoming personalized. But let's look deeper. You have product placement. Apple, Samsung, Sony, big brands have lined up at the fact that A, House of Cards was a huge success, B, it was actually predicted that it was a success, and C, we can now 
take that orange and keep squeezing it to make some orange juice. Again, ask yourself, personalization is great, but what is the cost of personalization? It's time to become an active and engaged consumer, not just a passive one. Let's take Doritos. Doritos wanted to help consumers consume chips. They found over time, with the launch of iTunes, in-app purchasing, a lot of the micropayments that are going on, that consumers are spending a lot of their disposal income elsewhere. So what do they do? They look on the Twitter sphere, look on Facebook, they look on Instagram, they find what are people doing these days from a social perspective. So one great artist is Rihanna. So what they did is they worked with Rihanna and said, hey, let's do something that's really engaging and amazing for a consumer. Rihanna said, that sounds great, but here's the catch. In order to look at that unlocked content, you, the consumer, have to buy a bag of Doritos. Now, you could be telling yourself, wait, that already happened. Cracker Jacks did that. I bought a lot of cool Cracker Jacks. Those free tattoos were awesome. <laughs> However, this time around, it's not just a tattoo or a little toy soldier. It's actually personalized information they're collecting from you. Now they're telling you, to, hey, like me on Facebook. Hey, add me on Instagram. Hey, tell all your friends that you just did this. And guess what? You bought the chips not to eat them, but since they're sitting on your desk, high probability you will be eating them. It wasn't always this way. How did it become so good? 2013, you basically have data, which has become almost free. You have elastic computing, which is making computing and processing power very affordable near zero. That means that brands and agencies are able to calculate things in near real time, which means that they're able to predict what you, the consumer, is going to be doing with a very high level of probability. Advertising really had three phases. In the beginning, it was very informational. When wars were happening, we used advertising to basically help people get enlisted. When there were diseases like malaria and the plague, we used advertising to help people tell, hey, this is the medicine you should be having. In the 1920s, you had the birth of the car, which then gave rise to billboards. You had electricity, which then gave rise to Times Square. You then had psychologists matching with brands, who also then matched with the burst of consumerism. And then it really then made, how do consumers want something more than they need it? We try to make the human nature of emotion logical. We try to make a model out of emotion. And guess what? We are now in 2013, and we are, probably in my perspective, the biggest gap between the marketer, the consumer, we've ever seen in our lifetime. We are now become the passive producer. Let's take some examples. In 1910, vitamins were discovered. 30 years later, 1940, donuts were entering the market. And what did a big marketer say? Let's figure out how we can actually make vitamin donuts. Imagine waking up in the morning, grabbing your fresh vitamin donut. This is an example of how do we take emotions and couple that with the consumer. 7-Up, let's not take for granted that 7-Up is actually now found in most households or in offices. They were thinking when they came out is how do, we, how do we tie to that human nature of emotion and the love for a baby? Why not every morning you mix your 7-Up with mother's milk? This ad campaign was launched and was successful. Cellophane. Let's not take for granted what happened with plastic bags. Plastic bags are everywhere in the store, but guess what? In the mid-1900s, they weren't. So what did plastic bag companies try to do, like DuPont? They said, how do we take the human emotion of love for a baby? Let's wrap that in a plastic bag. <laughs> so, so, you know, we, we look back, and we're astonished at these ad units. We're like, how ignorant could we have been as a culture? But guess what? I do not want to be 30 years in the future and giving the same presentation. But guess what? If we don't change our mindset and what we're going to be doing, the probability for that happening is huge. Take a company like Blukai. They are a data company. So we're fast forwarding now to 2013. As you go on the internet, you're on Facebook, you're on Google, you go to CNN, you go to ESPN, you go to your mobile device, you go to your tablet, you go to your desktop. You're in a multi-channel or multi-medium world. And as you keep moving, people are dropping pixels on you. And they're able now to track what you do. And as a result of tracking what you do, they're creating anonymous audiences of, of yourself. 
So in terms of judging a book by its cover, the algorithms and the data companies are doing that. Now, it's not always a bad thing. However, consumers need to be aware that it's happening. And most consumers are not. Let's take AOL search, companies similar to Google, similar to Bing. They thought it would be very interesting to take three months of search data and 2% of that and give it out for free, saying, hey, look, we've had about 675 million consumers use our search. We've had 20 million, 300 million search queries. Let's figure out what does the, what does the consumer and the researchers do with all this cool data? What happened? They found that the data was actually not really anonymous. Consumers are trusting the search box way too much. They found that some people put their credit card number in when they search. Some people put their flight confirmation number in when they search. Some people put their own phone number in when they search. Some people put their best friends in when they search. I know I've done it before. However, the question really becomes is when you're there, you have this implicit level of trust. Because this computer, you're just looking at a screen. The lens of what you look at this data is very passive. But marketers are actually taking all that information and making it very active. Target is another great example. Target has now basically created predictable models on figuring out when a consumer is going to be pregnant. And okay, they're also now working on it if it's going to be a boy or a girl, just depending on what you buy. A high school student was found buying something that alerted the system to create, hey, this person is pregnant. That house then got mailers for baby food, strollers. The father of that house went to the target like, why am I getting this? No one in our house is pregnant. He goes home the next day and finds that his daughter was actually pregnant. I want you to ask yourself, do I want to be judged by a cover? Or do I want to be judged by who really I am? And it's becoming so scientific. It's becoming like antiseptic. There are companies, however, that are making the right steps forward. But they're making the right steps forward because you, the consumer, are being engaged. You're helping drive that, that conversation. The assumptions that you're making as an individual are expressing yourself outward, right? You're not just liking anything you see. You're not sharing anything you see. You're actually understanding and being passionate about, about what you talk about. Take Tom's. Tom's actually launched the buy one, get one movement. For every pair of shoes you buy, they'll give one to an emerging country. Warby Parker, they make eyeglasses. They took it to the next level. For every set of glasses you buy, they'll not only donate one, but they'll help create sustainable economies where they'll educate people on eyeglasses, and they'll also train people on how to be better doctors. Now again, when you ask yourself what's going on, what type of brand do you want to support? And guess what? Warby Parker's profits have gone up 400 to 500%. Just because 95% of the people polled, they said they will choose a brand over quality if the brand really fights for what they believe in. We are undergoing the biggest digital revolution of our lifetime. The smartphone, in my opinion, has catalyzed our civilization to the next level because it's always on. It's always tracking you. However, we, the consumer, are not doing anything about it because we are letting the marketer lead the path for us. So you have, two, two, you have a question. You have a choice. Do you take the blue pill? Continue your day-to-day -day life. Share everything. Like everything. Search everything you want on your popular search. Do you like anything on Instagram? Take more pictures. Or do you take the red pill? You drive your life forward. You figure out what you actually want to believe in. You figure out, is it worth retweeting this message? Is it worth liking this message? You figure out, is it worth that Google is now searching my email? You must ask yourself these fundamental questions. Because what's happening right now as a marketer is really kind of pushing yourself. They're, they're making you think, I'm actually in control. But, they're, but you're not. So I really hope that you guys now are inspired to take control of you as a consumer and take the red pill. Thank you.